I am pleased to have the opportunity to come and talk about stuff. Uh, in fact, what I want to talk about is DevOps and SRE, right? Now, they've both been around for a long time now, and there's been a lot of discussion about them individually and together. Are they friends? Are they enemies? Do they maybe not actually have feelings because they're actually conceptual frameworks, they're not people? <laughs> but a few years back, this phrase was coined. SRE implements DevOps, right? You might have heard this before. It's an analogy in the way that an object-oriented class implements an interface, SRE is a concrete realization of abstract DevOps philosophy. Now, I'm not exactly sure who came up with this, but it might have been Liz Fong Jones, who is here with us, and that makes me super nervous. But it's not because I'm here to criticize this. In fact, I'm, I'm here to support this assertion. But I do want to poke at it just a little. Because it's really more of a hypothesis than an axiom, right? When we've heard this, we said, that seems about right, but we didn't really have any data to back it up. We wanted to ask, what really happens out there in the field? What happens when DevOps teams do SRE things? Are SREs actually DevOps engineers? Sorry, threw up in my mouth a little bit there. <laughs> and also, while we're looking at it, does SRE work? Let's ask these questions. So. We sat down to do them. Now, I'm some guy named Dave. Um, I, uh, I did wander in off the street, but that was after coming from the Google New York office, uh, where I do DevRel stuff, um, where I work on um, best practices around DevOps and SRE. Uh, please find me on Twitter at David Stanky. Would love to talk about this stuff all the time. Uh, and this year, I was uh, involved in the project within the Dora Research Project. What's that? Tell you in a minute. Uh, to look at DevOps and SRE together. So, First question, what is DevOps? Now, for a term that gets thrown around so much, it's maybe surprising that there is no canonical definition. There's no manifesto. And this was really on purpose, right? DevOps is a conversation, and it's an ongoing process of self-defining. But of course, that doesn't stop us from offering definitions, and I want to give you one. My definition is a picture. It looks like this. DevOps is when we use communication and automation to achieve velocity and stability all in service of delivering happy users. Now, cool, it's hard to argue with, hey, we want happy users, and we like things that are fast, and we, we want to let the computers do the work. But the question is, what do we do with that? Right? This stuff should be practical. We want to be able to use this stuff in our jobs to get stuff done. So the question becomes, how do we put DevOps into practice? And there's actually a whole group of people that have been asking this question for a long time. And, and I'm here representing this research group called the DevOps Research and Assessment Group, or DORA. Um, this is the largest and longest running study of its kind. We've been going for eight years, I think it is now. It, it actually predates uh, Google. We acquired them a couple years ago, and they're part of our Google Cloud team now. Uh, but they were out there in the field doing this research for a long time, uh, started by uh, Nicole Forsgren along with Jess Humble. And, so for nearly a decade, this project has collected data from tens of thousands of technical practitioners across thousands of organizations and applied rigorous statistical methods to draw conclusions about what works and what doesn't. Here's a, a quick snapshot of, of what we study. You can get a lot of detail about the data um, collection me methods and the people in the study. So in the data collection, we gather data about inputs and outputs, things that a team does and the results they get. And from that, we've developed a predictive model of capabilities and outcomes. And by capabilities, we mean the adoption of any number of practices. These are technical practices like the use of version control, or organizational practices like streamlined change management, and culture like embracing blamelessness. Now, that word predictive is important. It's stronger than correlation, but it's not quite a causation. What it says is that adopting a given capability increases the likelihood of achieving the next node on the graph. So capabilities can increase our chances of favorable outcomes. What kind of outcomes might we want? Well, let's skip all the way to the end and talk about the big stuff that everyone wants, the stuff that we're paid to want, like revenue and user growth, right? This is the whole point of the having a company thing. Uh, so we should probably just tell everyone, hey, go make profit happen, right? It doesn't really work that way, because those are trailing indicators. And we need something we can measure earlier. So what we found is that this construct in our analysis called software delivery and operations performance 
is predictive of those commercial outcomes. Now, this is, probably doesn't surprise anyone here, but it's good to have data. So to earn their paychecks, engineers should be trying to get better at engineering. Cool. Now, there's an old saying, you can't improve what you don't measure. How do we measure software delivery and engineering? We've never really been very good at that. Anyone remember measuring lines of code? <laughs> That's just a great way to write yourself a quick bot that will write a whole bunch of code for you. So then we said, okay, how about we measure uh, bug resolutions? Well, just a, just a little bit harder to write a bot that will write bugs and then fix them for you. We've never really been good at this. But Dora has actually found a reliable and, and, and repeatable way of measuring success for software delivery. And it's these four key metrics. These are a concise, robust framework that does predict real world outcomes. There are four of them. Two about speed, so deployment frequency. How often are we releasing code to users? And lead time for changes. How long does it take from the time code is committed to when it's delivered in production to a user? Now these are balanced against two stability metrics. One's the change failure rate. Of the times that we deploy software into prod, how often does it go boom and we say, oh crud, and we have to hurry up and fix it? And then time to restore, oh yes, I said it, I said it. I said time to restore service. Now, listen, it's median time to restore service. That's something. But I also want to point out that the data, the, the math says that this thing works, right? Our math finds that across this huge data set, time to restore service along with these other three in this construct we call software delivery performance is predictive of commercial outcomes. So there's something there, and I would love to debate it with you. I'm, I'm not going to try and stand up for it except to say somewhere in the model it works. Um, so we call these the four key metrics. Sometimes they're called the four golden DevOps metrics. You can find them throughout the, the DevOps literature. And they add up, as I mentioned, to something called software delivery performance. And then we uh, assess teams based on their success of these four, do a cluster analysis, and we put them into four buckets, low, medium, high, and elite. Um, one thing you'll notice here is that the uh, success on these metrics moves together. So the teams that are shipping the fastest also have the most stability in their releases. In fact, it can be a pretty dramatic spread. Uh, comparing elite teams to low teams, the elite teams are deploying almost a thousand times more often. You know, we're talking about deployments are multiple per day or hour rather than every six months or something. Um, and they're getting their code out way faster, shipping value to their users way faster. And then at the same time, those releases are much less likely to fail. And then similarly to the fact that they can get code out fast, they can also get fixes out fast. So these elite teams are really kicking butt. Now, we can measure that software delivery performance according to those metrics. But still, in some ways, a trailing indicator. It's a trailing indicator for your team. So how do we sit down and say, what, are we, what is our team going to do to get better at software delivery? And that's where we bring in this capability catalog. Uh, you can find uh, all of this in, uh, on our website in our literature. Uh, check out g.co slash DevOps. That's a new URL g.co slash DevOps, and it lists all the capabilities, and for each one of them, you'll find an article that talks about what it is, how to measure it, how to get started. So this becomes a map for a team to say, if I want to get better at delivering value to my company, I need to get better at my SDO performance, and these are the capabilities that are going to get there, get me there. Great article, uh, sorry, a great report. I encourage you all to go read it. It's uh, quick, and it's got, even if you've read the previous reports, there's new stuff every year. So check that out, bit.ly slash Dora dash Soder. Okay. Now, what's SRE? This is the part of the talk where usually I explain what is SRE, but I'm in front of an audience here who can answer that question way better than I can. So let's move on to the battle royale. Fight or don't. I don't know. Are we going to have a problem here? What I know is that this question has been asked for a long time. Uh, I am uh, a member of the coffee ops group in New York. If anyone's in New York, stop by. Of course, it's virtual now, but uh, you can stop by there for any time. And uh, there's a running joke that uh, if no one knows what to talk about, how about we'll just ask about Dev DevOps versus SRE. So are they competing? Which one is better, right? And we know that DevOps predicts organizational success. Does SRE make good things happen? Maybe we could bring some science and answer these questions. I know some scientists. 
But before we answer this question, I want to take a second to look at the breadth of these terms. DevOps really started here in the dev to deploy, right? It's about that proverbial wall and breaking down the barriers between your dev team and your ops team so you can get code into prod. And SRE lives a little more in here, after things get into prod or as it gets into prod and keeping it going, keeping it in prod. Now, as DevOps started entering into organizations and entering a conversation, people started realizing how important the interactions were with not just dev and ops, but also with product, with business, with users, with finance, with legal. And the scope started to expand. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, though it did lead to some awkward portmanteaus like biz DevOps or dev sci ops. Ikea guy, you still here? No, it was great. Good talk, good talk. And all of these things started to become part of the DevOps conversation. In fact, product, for example, in Dora, in our research, we endorse lean product as a way of doing product that's really congruent with DevOps. So what about ops? Does ops fit in, right? We've talked about the, quote, stability of software. That's mostly from the point of view of delivery. Can we get it into prod and have it kind of stick? But then the question is, what happens after that? What happens over the lifetime of software, which, as we all know, is actually a lot longer than the brief, hopefully, moment that it takes to get it into prod? What happens after that? So last year, we used the Dora project to look into SRE. Now, we had made some initial um, uh, pokes into this area, starting back in 2018. That year, we added a fifth metric, which we called availability. And we defined availability as the ability for technology teams and organizations to make and keep promises and assertions about the software, product, or service they are operating. That definition to folks in this room probably sounds something more like reliability. Uh, and that's what, how we've been saying what reliability is, and that it contains and includes availability and performance and correctness, right? So it turns out we've been talking about the same ideas. We've just been using the terms in different ways. So the first thing we did this year was to align on the terminology. We changed it from availability to reliability. And we set out to study how teams achieve that. Do they do the SRE? Now, we didn't just want to ask people, so uh, do you SRE? That can cause both false positives and false negatives, right? There are teams called SRE that operate in all different ways. And there are also places like Facebook, for example, where they do operations in a very SRE kind of way, but they call it production engineering. Cool. So we took a duck typing approach. If a team acts like SRE, then we say they're doing SRE. So what we did is we took the literature and we distilled it down into succinct statements of practice, stripped out most of the jargon, right? And we boiled it down to a set of statements that we added to our, Dora, our Soder survey that we put out last year. And you'll see you know, a combination of statements here, things that reflect uh, SLI and SLO kind of practices. You'll see toil reduction. You'll see some of the culture things. Now, this is necessarily reductive and imperfect and incomplete. I am sure we got some things wrong. But we did get it right enough to have statistically significant findings. What did we find? OK, item one, SRE is widely practiced. This was really a surprise to me. Uh, less surprising now that I'm here seeing so many different companies, so many different people. But there's always been sort of this guess that, like, well, SRE really only happens at big places like Google and Facebook. But um, what we found is that the data says that the majority of teams that we studied are doing SRE to some degree. It's a small majority, but it's a majority. And um, we, of course, only been studying this one year, but it's probably growing. This is really happening all around uh, the, the technology community. And, um, and you know, at the same time, we also know that even in a place like Google, different teams do SRE in different ways and to different extents. So when we take away some of the jargon, we find that these practices, these modern operations, reliability, engineering practices are really widespread. Second finding, SRE is good for humans and systems, and also for business. So, Recall that predictive model that we use. Uh, it's, if a team does X, that's predictive of Y. This is a simplified view of the model. You could find the whole thing at bit.ly uh, bit slash Dora dash BFD. That's the big friendly diagram. 
And we found that SRE has multiple benefits. SRE is good for humans. It mitigates burnout, so we have happier operations team with higher impact. Um, it can help teams have more you know, engaging particular kind of work, like getting away from you know, toil right, and doing uh, more of that creative strategic stuff. It's good for the applications. SRE works, right? Uh, having that shared responsibility for operations predicts higher reliability outcomes and it predicts higher reliability in of itself. And it's good for business. Higher reliability and uh, better, more thorough reliability practices predicts better business outcomes. And that, but of course, as I mentioned, means things like revenue, user retention, even things like stock price. So let's take a look at how that works. I like to say that reliability is a force multiplier. Now we've got software delivery performance that's measured by those four key metrics around velocity and initial success rate. We found that reliability moves orthogonally to software delivery. Teams that succeed in, in one of these don't necessarily succeed in both. But when we put them together, we get a compound effect on the value that technology organization can deliver to the business or to the organization. Teams with high software delivery performance scores who also uh, leverage reliability engineering practices extensively are 1.8 times more likely to report that their businesses achieve their commercial goals. But while SRE is widely used and has demonstrable benefits, very few respondents indicated that their teams have, indicated, or have implemented every SRE technique we studied. There's a huge range at every level. And increased use of SRE has benefits at every level. Within every one of our clusters, the low, the medium, the high of software performance, teams that also meet their reliability goals outperform other members of their cluster in regard to business outcomes. All right, it's time for my hot takes. So these are informed by my reading of the research, but they shouldn't be taken as formal findings of the research team. Hot take one. SRE implements part of DevOps. DevOps has become all the things. And, and I think that's great, really, because people have embraced the value of technology in driving business, and they're bringing lots of stakeholders into software strategy. But SRE shouldn't try to be all the things. For one thing, SRE has dependencies. Uh, we've had the experience in our consulting practice of going to companies, and they say, hey, we're really excited. We want to try SRE. And we say, great. Uh, what version control system do you use? And they say, well, we don't do version control. That's okay, that's okay, we all gotta get somewhere. But if you try to lead an organization into a modern way of operating, starting from SRE, you're probably not gonna have an easy time. Instead, what we wanna do is introduce it to a place that's already on a DevOps journey. And you know, DevOps is something that we've got literature and resources and community in a much broader way. So SRE is part of an overall DevOps organization and, 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 uh, and culture, right? And another thing that we've seen is that if an organization tries to prematurely adopt SRE, it may backfire. I've, I've heard organizations say, we tried SRE and it failed. Now that doesn't mean that SRE is always gonna work if it's done right, though I kinda think maybe it is. But what it means is that in those cases that I'm talking about, they weren't really ready, they weren't primed to use SRE, and they needed to start with something more fundamental in the DevOps world about how they uh, approach communication and collaboration. All right, hot take two. There is a, a fundamental cultural theme that we are discovering through all of these uh, movements. Right, we've got SRE that for 15 something years inside Google and now collectively at, uh, across the world has been discovering this blameless culture, communication, uh, collaboration, and at the same time DevOps is discovering its own set of culture, um, Westrom organizational culture, something we study as part of DORA. There's psychological safety, which is something you read a lot about in the uh, business literature these days, the Toyota production system. So many of these things are about trust and autonomy and communication, and we seem to be independently discovering the value of these across so many different lines of inquiry. There's something fundamental underneath that they're all revealing, and something that's seemingly very true and very powerful. Why do we have to keep discovering it? 
And that's a question for a different time, but uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough one and makes me both excited about the future and a little worried about humanity that we can't seem to learn this lesson, but we're, we are all learning it right now. All right, my last hot take is this, ops is still ops, right? Uh, as I mentioned, ops moves orthogonally to software delivery performance. Uh, we find that shared destiny, cross-functional co cross collaborations are good, but specialization is still very normal and it's probably necessary. Uh, the, there can be a, a, a challenge sometimes when we look at DevOps culture or SRE culture, a belief that you should be having full stack engineers who can do everything themselves. And we all know that's probably not gonna happen. And what we're learning is that that doesn't seem to be feasible nor desirable. Um, we need ops specialists. We need to change the way we do ops. We need to change how the organization thinks about ops, but we still need ops. That is our study uh, and our conclusions. I would love to hear your thoughts and answer any questions. Thank you.